I have absolutely but fuck no idea how the hell to start this. First off, who the hell is going to be in the blue team? We can generally assume the red team lineup, Sarge, Griff, Simmons, Donut, and Lopez. Blue team, however, is very inconsistent. The only consistent members are Tucker and Caboose. The next time trailer does have Sheila and Church as well, I think. I don't remember actually, but I think it did. So maybe they'll be in there. But I don't know who else. Agent Washington is apparently still in the team. He's a member of Blue Team. I haven't kept up since Season 10. The Chorus Trilogy was just so unfunny to me and I dropped it. I do have the Blu-ray set of the first 10 seasons and I unironically do really like those seasons. But if they weren't using Kate's Venom, then they probably won't use Agent Washington. If they do, then Blue Team win. Washington is technically part of Blue Team, but he's also a freelancer, so he's just on a whole other level to everyone else. He is no Maine or Carolina or Texas in skill, but he is a more entertaining character than any of them. Washington's the best freelancer, fuck you. Anyway, I'd assume Tucker, Caboose, Sister, Church, and Sheila maybe would be the lineup? Uh, just because they need five to match the five on red team and that's like the best they could do is the first three plus the tank from the first season plus one of the other consistent characters anyway who do i think will win probably red team i i can't fully explain without talking about something that people probably don't want to know about because it could contain spoilers for the season overall but i'll just give you the footnotes version so Tucker is just the most individually competent of these characters. Sarge is a nutcase, Griff is useless half the time, Simmons is a bit of an idiot, Donut sucks at life, and Lopez is probably the only character that comes close to Tucker, but he's the- uh, Tucker is the only competent member of Blue Squad at all. Sister is completely worthless, the only skill she has that she's not altogether incompetent at is driving. Caboose, I'll talk about later. Church can't shoot for shit. And Sheila's a tank, but Donut killed her once. Anyway, Tucker and Lopez are the only actually competent people here. Sarge is good at killing people though, which gives him an advantage in a death battle. Simmons and Griff are probably less useless than Sister, and Sheila's great and all, but... <sighs> okay, guys, look. I do hope this episode's good, but I also don't know really how much I can talk about it when we don't know the lineups for Blue Team. We don't know who's gonna even be in the battle, and that's the real problem. I would love to talk about it. I do like the first 10 seasons of Red vs. Blue, and I did enjoy the previous Red vs. Blue episode, Meta vs. Carolina. But I think this episode is probably going to just come across as bootleg Meta vs. Carolina. Meta vs. Carolina Poverty Edition. Meta vs. Carolina Light. Meta vs. Carolina, but it's not Meta vs. Carolina. But there is one thing I would be interested in seeing, and that's how they actually animate the fight. So the freelancers are most well known for the fully 3D animated portions of the series, so the actual death battle being fully 3D actually fit quite well. However, Red and Blue Team are most well known for the traditional machinima animation style, and I do think that's something that could be interesting to see explored in the episode. What if they did the fight with a good portion of it being in that machinima style, with all the accompanying jank and really stupid looking animations and most of the fight just being the characters talking? A fully action oriented episode really doesn't fit these characters at all. And this is definitely the joke battle of the season, so having a focus on being funny would definitely be on their mind, at least hopefully more so than it was for Deadpool vs Mask, which was not funny. <laughs> outside of the analysis. <clears throat> so now's where I have to talk about the leak. Now the validity of the leak is still in question because it's a leak and I am obviously very skeptical about it because it is a leak in spite of how accurate it has managed to be so far. However, I will, be I will be discussing it and if you don't want to avoid potential spoilers for upcoming things in the season, skip to this point in the video and you can watch me complain about Chrono and Venom's fight. Alright, so, the leak makes it clear that Caboose is gonna die. <laughs> there was a death scream mentioned in his audition, and that makes me think Red Team is likely to win. Caboose is the most beloved character in Red vs. Blue. And 
he would likely win the battle for blue team if blue team won. I don't really see him, I don't really see blue team winning and someone other than Caboose being the one to be delivering the final blow. And also, he's likely to be in Sheila if Sheila is used, you know, because he's the one who drove the tank in the show. He would likely die along with her, and if he is in Sheila, then I'd imagine he's going to die from Donut throwing a plasma grenade onto Sheila because, haha, <laughs> that happened in season one of Red vs. Blue, it's a funny reference. They might not do that, but they also might do that. Additionally, he's also often portrayed as having abnormal strength. He can, like, one-shot text drones with his bare hands. So if he dies, that that's, that's a pretty big thing, because he's the strongest member of Blue Team. As for the validity of the leak, it did predict Caboose in Death Battle, it did predict Wally beating Archie Sonic, and most importantly, it did predict Butcher and the Seven fighting from the boys. That's the real nail in the coffin for most people. Now, Sanji vs. Rock Lee and John Talbane vs. Saber Wolf have yet to happen, which is my main reason for being skeptical still. But this being, uh, but this leak being true would mean that I think Blue Team are gonna lose. Now let's talk about Venom vs. Krona. Once again, 70% of the video is that. But people complained when I took the reviews out of the predictions. So you're just gonna have to deal with that because I don't really know how much I can predict an episode where I only know half of the combatants that are going to even be involved. Okay, so, when I saw the preview for this episode, I was cautiously optimistic. Krona looked quite nice, the effects were good, and the hand-drawn stuff was very, very nice. And to be fair, the hand-drawn stuff was legitimately good in the finished episode. In fact, Krona overall did look really good in the episode. Some of the better puppet animation, if only because Krona kind of fits it with their weird and unnatural movement and having an all black color palette in terms of like their outfit means it's not as easy to tell where points of like their elbow and knee joints are cut off and just look weird and Ragnarok look great oh boy Nemesis is talking about the positives first does that mean he has a lot of negatives to talk about yes unfortunately it is more negative than positive in my eyes Starting with the analysis, because the animation is where all the good parts of the episodes are. The analysis is bad. It's very bad. Let's start with Venom. Most of it was okay for street tier Venom, but the feats aren't really there. He has the 200 ton Ferris wheel feat that they don't actually talk about. They just have it on the sidebar that most people miss because most people don't look at the actual things on the sidebar because they rightfully expect that the important stuff is going to be talked about and the sidebar is going to be for side shit. They have him surviving Ghost Rider's pen and stare more on that later. They talk about him throwing this but don't actually elaborate at all and they give him Mark 2000 speed. This is despite the fact that they had Miles Morales at light speed reaction times and while they did say that Venom's abilities are inferior to the spider sense, there is a massive gap between the speed of light and 0.0023 times the speed of light. At that slower speed, Venom should not be able to ever catch a Spider-Man character. Like, just, he would be 434 times slower than Miles Morales. I mean, maybe you think, Miles Mor maybe they think, Miles Morales is 434 times faster than any other Spider-Man or symbiote. But he is not. They talk about him taking this huge explosion, but because they never actually calculated Krona's attacking power, they didn't calculate how powerful the explosion he took is. It has been calculated at 2 kilotons of TNT, by the way. Not by Death Battle, but elsewhere. They did not calculate Krona's attacking potency, so they did not calculate Venom's durability. So for Venom, we have no lifting strength calcs, no striking strength calcs, no durability calcs, a speed that is inconsistent with what we had earlier in this very season, Really, all we got was Mark 2000, and even that's just weird. Then we have how they tackled Kate's Venom, and if you don't know, in the last three years, there's been a run by Donny Cates, I believe, of Venom, who has just become strong enough to take on characters like Hulk and Thor consistently. He is consistently at a Herald tier. Heralds are not solar system level, by the way, they are universal, or at least galaxy level, but that's just a thing that people do a lot on versus battles is make Herald's solar system level when they're not. Anyway, yeah, Venom has had this power for three years, and that's a lot of time. And uh, 
honestly, it's no different to like a shonen character. Like, why is a shonen character power up completely accepted, even if they could lose it in the future, maybe? But oh no, 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 no. Venom, that's just inconsistent. And yes, it is inconsistent because he got stronger. Just like how it's inconsistent that Goku can fight Frieza when previously he could only fight Vegeta and just barely. It's almost like he got stronger over time. Anyway, they disregard him being physically herald here because any codus based powers such as Ben Grimm's physical strength are likely not permanent. First off, how is a casual viewer supposed to know who the fuck Ben Grimm is? Even just saying the thing would have more meaning to most people. But also, you never even brought that up in the analysis at all. Something as important as the codexes, which was literally like, okay, the entire debate that happened in the two weeks that, th that we waited for this episode was Codex Venom being used and whether he could get past Krona's uh, mid low godly regen, which um, they got from Ashura, which is how they pronounce it in the episode, so I'm just gonna say it that way. None of that's brought up. The whole debate, all two weeks of debate, the entire thing on the G1 blog that they had predicting it, gone to the, the shitter. Just like a fart in the wind. It was not even brought up at all. Well done. And like, okay, Venom's had this immense strength for, and like they didn't bring up speed at all in terms of like, why is he not way faster than Venom if he can keep up with, uh, why is he not way faster than Krona if he can keep up with Thor and Hulk and Juggernaut. But he's had these powers for three years. We, we, we've been reading these comics for three years, and many other powers have burnt out over time, but their physical strength didn't. Maybe they'll dissipate in the future. We can't really say, but we can't say, we can't really, like, ex you can't really explain why they didn't use him now. He has these powers now. Like, what if, like, Super Saiyan God could have dissipated in the future because it was a temporary boost in Battle of Gods. If Resurrection F and Super never happened, would they just disregard God, Goku? I don't think they would, but they will for Venom because comics just don't get to have buffs like anime does. And the last Venom fight, they even scaled Venom to Juggernaut, and it's even in the sidebar of this episode. And when they talk about extenuating circumstances with Dark Carnage and Grendel, they don't bring up Juggernaut at all. Do they seriously fucking think Juggernaut is less impressive than Krona? He's not, that would just be objectively false. Now let's talk about Krona's analysis. Comparatively, this one is much better. Though I don't remember Marka's last name being Alburn. Also, when I went to double check her name on Google, one of the first auto-generated results was Marka Alban Pregnant, and I hate that so much. So two of the main deciding things they had in the conclusion were both related to the moon and they just sort of mentioned it in passing and didn't elaborate on it at all. And the calcs they gave for Krona are speed, which was fine, I'm okay with the speed they gave them, lifting strength, which is completely meaningless generally in versus debating, and also meaningless when you don't actively compare it to anything, and the amount of black blood they can create. Okay, let's get to the conclusion. First off, precise control of black blood is not something this dome demonstrates. In fact, making a big fuck off dome is not precise at all. It's about as precise as an atom bomb. In fact, they never really show examples of the black blood being overly precise. This comes off as super unprecise. Secondly, I'm just not a fan of how they handled Kate's venom. They used him, but only kind of, and they gave Krona blitzing speed and strength without giving Venom any feats to compare to strength-wise. Like, okay, Krona can bench 10,000 tons. What can Venom bench? You had the 200 tons in the thing that people most likely missed. Doesn't Venom have, any Venom have anything to compare to? He probably does, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, the research and conclusion here really bother me. As for the animation, it's very slow, and that's my main issue. It never really picks up, and the ending is just bad. Venom gets this big, epic, WE ARE VENOM speech, and then he just stands there like a fucking idiot, he just sees all these black whips coming around and grabbing him, and he just does not even try to get out. He doesn't even 
turn like he's turned into goop earlier in this animation he can do what ragnarok did early in the animation and get out of being grabbed but no he just doesn't give a fucking shit about the fact that he's about to be stabbed and screamed that and that's it he's just gone out of nowhere just gets stabbed in the solar plexus and screamed at by a bunch of swords and he's dead that is a very weird sentence but i'm going with it because that's what happened I can only assume he was distracted by Krona quoting Carnage vs. Lucy. Carnage! I should also note that they didn't really talk about hacks for either character, but they have this little sidebar that says the penance stare is a psychic attack. First off, it's a soul-based attack to my knowledge, but they said just because Venom has survived a psychic attack does not mean he's immune to psychic attacks. Well, can you... Kindly fucking explain Hiei and Obi-Wan Kenobi then? Because they have resisted psychic type attacks completely different to Genjutsu, but just because they resisted those attacks, they were considered immune to the Genjutsu of Kakashi and Sasuke. But Hiei's Dagon gave him telekinesis and mental protections, putting the brakes on Sasuke's eye shenanigans. Now, I don't really think that's completely necessary for the victors to be the same based on their research, but it's just kind of weird that being immune to psychic, or that just being resistant to psychic attacks for these two correlated to being able to deal with the Genjutsu, but Venom being immune to the Penance Stare, which is magnitudes more powerful than anything in Soul Eater, it is ridiculously powerful. Apparently, that's just not enough to deal with Krona's abilities. I, I'm fairly, like, there is a thing where, like, a uh, opponent with multiple eyes is more resistant to the penance stare, but I think, like, the smallest percentile of the penance stare is orders of magnitude more powerful than Krona's madness. The penance stare is insane. Okay, but how about we talk about some positives then? Let's talk about the positives. Happy, happy, happy times. The flight battle was decent. And as I said, Krona's sprites are quite nice, but the king of sprites in this animation is Ragnarok. He is very expressive despite not having a face, and he's very fluid, and he's got funny dialogue too. So I think he was the best part of the episode. Ragnarok was great. How was the episode overall? It was an episode, like a 5 out of 10, because it just is. The analysis is bad. And that sucks, given the analysis is 70% of an episode's total runtime. I completely forgot the script and outro to this video, so I'm just going to end it on a funny word. Waffle. Die.